Hello, I'm Brent Height, and I'm with my good friend and fellow researcher Scott Lamb, and we are in Spyro, Oklahoma. Today we're going to be talking about the Spyro Mounds. So I drove to Fort Smith, Arkansas to meet up with my friend Scott Lamb. We then drove across the state line into Oklahoma to a place called Spyro, Oklahoma, where the Spyro Mounds are located on the banks of the Arkansas River. At the site there is a visitor center and an exhibit hall with artifacts on display. There's also a series of trails that winds through the complex so you can look at the different mound structures. So when we got to the park, we headed straight into the visitor center to see what information we could learn about the site and to look at the many artifacts that were on display. Inside the visitor center, there was a model of the site on display and many articles to read about the culture that once inhabited the site. There was lots of artwork inside, as well as pottery, stone artifacts, and even some metal artifacts that we're going to discuss now. these artifacts and I want you to zoom in on this one right here and if you'll notice the piece on the right there the turquoise looking piece that's a piece of copper ore and this is typical of places that I've visited like Cahokia, Totec, the Totec Mounds near Little Rock Arkansas, Poverty Point in Louisiana each museum shows a representation of this copper ore. Usually you can identify this as Michigan copper and Michigan copper is easily identifiable because it's so pure. You can look at it under a microscope and you can tell that this came from Michigan. You find it in South America, you find it in Europe, you find it all over the United States. So this is proof that in ancient times there was a copper trade going on. It probably came down the Mississippi rivers and then went up the Arkansas River in order to get to this place. But they were trading and using copper and I'm sure we'll see some copper, copper artifacts in a few minutes. But I wanted to point out this piece of copper ore because this was an important part of this culture. So here's a piece of, a couple of pieces of copper artifacts. Let me see if I can look down upon them there. Another copper artifact. And I believe this symbolizes the Pleiades. There were also many artifacts that had carvings on them on conch shells or other kind of shells that come from the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Gulf Coast, but they were certainly not native to Oklahoma. So they were obviously brought here by visitors to the site. So this is an interesting piece of artwork on this conch shell. And if you'll notice in the center, there's a symbol that shows up in a lot of the artifacts around here. And that's the symbol of the eternal flame, or which would also be a representation of the sun as these people were worshipers of the sun. So this next item is an effigy pipe known as the Lucifer pipe, and it was of particular interest to Scott. 
But that's a big piece that I've been really interested in seeing because it only looks this big when you're looking at it. But look how, how big this pipe is. Mm -hmm. And what fascinates me is where did the name Lucifer come from? Was this thing, this name given to it after some time it was found or was this the original uh, replica piece? Uh, so a little bit further investigation into this piece here. Looks like it belonged to a giant. It does. It's big enough, isn't it? So what does this say about it? This is a 1350 to 1425, although known as the Lucifer pipe. It is not the image of the devil. The figure represents a deer spirit dancer. The pipe was used to smoke sacred tobacco upon the death of the owner. The pipe was broken and placed with him in the burial mound. And I believe that would be Craig's mound. This is a little, notice the hairline and the rounded nose almost uh, looks a little bit like Mayan art. Yep. Influence on this. This is another pipe, a replica. And then look over here at this copper piece here. We have the same hairline, same rounded nose there. Yes. Aztec or Mayan or. Very similar. Very similar art. Yeah. Yeah, they said this was the equivalent of finding King Tut's tomb because of all the artifacts that were found in it. Here's some of the shell beads that were also probably could have been used as money also. So the first two mounds you see at Spyro are called the Ward Mound 1 and 2, probably named after the property owner that discovered them. But there's one and there's two. And then there's a creek bottom there. And this creek runs down through the property. And over across those trees there is Craig's Mound, which is the burial mound uh, of this complex. So this is the first two mounds that you see when you come to Spyro. Uh, it's actually been reconstructed because they actually tore it down in order to get the artifacts out of it. And then they reconstructed it and put it back in place, put the dirt back in place. So this is not how it originally sat. I mean, it's, a, it's in the position that it originally sat. It may be altered a little bit one way or another, so that could affect some kind of alignments. So on the other side of this mound is a borrow pit. And the pit is where this dirt came from. And so you could, uh, you could tell, you can do soil samples and you can tell if this was built in layers or you could have before they tore it down in the 30s. You could tell if this was one single construction or if it was built layer by layer uh, over time. So uh, we, don't, we don't know the answer to that because they tore this mound down back in the 30s. But like at Poverty Point, they've done soil samples there and they determined that that, built, that mound was probably built within a 90 day period. So it was one single people that built that. In some of these places that you go to, um, it's different generations are adding to and, and building the height of these structures. So Spyro is one of the most significant archeological sites in the United States for several reasons, but we've learned some things uh, prior to coming here and now that we've visited and we've got to see the museum and see some of the artifacts, Scott, what's what's three of the things, most significant things that stick out to you the most about this place? I'll tell you, Brent, in the archaeology center they got in there, one of the things we see is the artwork, for one thing. Seems to be a, a real familiar with things we've seen with, with Mayans, with Aztec. Uh, some of the items that show up here would be like from Wisconsin to Oklahoma. So we're starting to see some evidence of a trade system. I believe it's probably a global trade system, but let's just say it, for sure east and west down the Arkansas River mm -hmm. and through the Mississippi and all through that time period uh, there was some kind of trade going on. 
The other thing after getting here, this kind of off of the subject, was that huge mound over here that's not part of this site and how they kind of line up and it's the highest point uh, as far as you can see. You know, our Oklahoma's pretty flat, so uh, that's real evidence sticking out there. I'd like to find out some more about that. All right. And I believe the other thing is this mound has some kind of mystery to it because we're standing at Craig's mound and uh, not only is it a burial site, obviously, but there is some speculation that maybe a giant was found in this one uh, by a mining company, I believe, in the 1930s. And Back in the 30s. And they say that the bones just disappeared, which is typical of any time there's any kind of uh, abnormalities found in skeletal remains, it seems like they always disappear or they get swept up by the Smithsonian or something. But anyway, so yeah, that's, that's three things that stand out in my mind also. Uh, Another thing that we're going to be doing here in just a few minutes is uh, there's some alignments here. And I brought a compass with me today. We'll be looking at some compass readings. And we're going to go to another mound. Like we said, this is Craig's Mound. This is the burial mound of this place. And this was the equivalent of uh, finding King Tut's tomb. Uh, there was, there's just, this place was artifact rich. Anyway, uh, thousands of artifacts were found here, but we're going to go to the center of this complex, to Brown's Mound, and we're going to try to see if we can find some um, alignments uh, with the equinox and the solstices and maybe possibly connect these to other sites in the United States. We're at Brown's Mound, which is the center of this complex, and supposedly you can take, uh, you can take lines and you can draw from mound to mound there's you see that mound in the distance over there would be one of the mounds and you can depict uh, the solstices and the equinox and that was important to this culture because it was embedded into their religious practices so what I'm going to do now is what I typically do when I go to sites like this is I carry a compass with me and I'm going to find north which is this way behind us and so after you find north, you can determine your east-west line, which is important to this culture. And east would be this way. And so somewhere probably in these trees is a mound that would line up with in the spring with the, with the solstices. And also in the fall, there would be one this way. So just with using a simple compass, you can see if there's that kind of practice that's taking place here. And uh, it's already been done. The literature that we saw in the museum shows that and has it mapped out. So um, we know that uh, it's already been done. So we're just out here testing. And this is an example of what we do when we go to sites like this. Okay, so we're standing at Brown's Mound, which is the center of this complex. And Scott, tell us about a couple of artifacts that were found in this mound. Well, one of them is the uh, Lucifer pipe that we've seen on the uh, exhibit inside, and it's also known as the Deer Dancer Pipe. Okay. Uh, this mound here probably had a perpetual flame that was burning, and it would tie right in with the Nat Natchez Indians, uh, some of the other history we have about this eternal flame. And another thing is that disc that we saw inside. Uh, it was actually a disc of a disc on a cross inside. Did you know we, Yeah. I think we pointed that out in there. Yeah, and it's uh, that cross... It's a cross with a circle around it, and then the symbol of the eternal flames in the very center. And the cross kind of looks Celtic to me. Um, but this is, would be the mound, the ceremonial mound, where the, the eternal flame would be burning, which the eternal flame represents the sun, thus these people were sun god worshippers. And so about the first item, the Lucifer pipe, is that what you called it? So what, what have you learned if anything at all about that, or are you still researching that? Still researching. So far, no one can give me a clear example or, as to why it even got that name, mm -hmm. um, where it was added to, or why. It doesn't represent Lucifer in any way, uh, but it is the worship of the, the sun god. And so this, this is a ceremonial pipe, obviously they did, but it looks so huge, you know, that I, I would almost guess it could be belong to somebody of an abnormal size. Yeah. Uh, you know, another another interesting thing about the religious practices that were taking place here, this is this was a religious center where people came from even thousands of miles to, to come here. It was like it was like the Mecca for this culture. And so one of the practices that is theorized 
is that they would drink stuff or they would smoke a substance that would cause them to vomit. And this would purge them. They would do this practice for three days and this would purge them to prepare them for the, the event which would probably be held on one of the solstice days. But only, from what I understand in this culture, only the men were allowed to come here and they had to go through rituals in order to prepare themselves for the event that took place here, which was a solar event. Thus, that's why they're doing these type of practices because they are worshiping the sun. So this off-site mound in the distance that Scott mentioned earlier has got our curiosity up. So Scott tries to find a road to get us close to this thing so maybe we can get the drone in the air and fly around this thing and investigate and see what this is. So is this mound part of the rest of the mounds at Spyro that sit nearly two miles away? Was it a lookout post or was it one of the high places like mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible? I feel certain that the inhabitants of Spyro many years ago had a use for this place and it was incorporated into their culture somehow.